Midway USA brand product designers have one straightforward goal. Develop high-quality, technically sound products and deliver them to customers at reasonable prices. If you are immersed in the shooting sports industry and pay close attention to every single detail, you know our products are built right and stand up to everyday use. Who has shooting mats and range bag systems to hunting clothing and just about everything for the outdoors? Log on and shop 24-7 with super fast shipping. MidwayUSA.com Fishing like a local isn't just about catching fish. It's about connecting with the environment and the people who call it home. It's about hearing the stories and traditions that have been passed down for generations and sharing unforgettable moments with the people you meet along the way. Fishing like a local is having an experience that stays with you forever. And with Fishing Booker, you can experience it too, no matter where you are. Discover your next adventure on Fishing Booker. Welcome to the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast. I'm Matthew of castingacross.com, where I explore the quarry and culture of fly fishing. This is episode 168, 168th episode of the podcast. We're going to talk about pivoting while fly fishing, pivoting while fly fishing. Before I get to that, just as I always do, I'd like to remind folks that once I hit the 170th episode, I'm going to do a listener and reader feedback, a fly fishing accusations podcast. So if you have any comments, if you have any questions, feel free to send those my way, Matthew at castingacross.com. And in two weeks, I will record a questions and answers and listener feedback podcast. But today we're going to talk about pivoting while fly fishing. Why is this a topic to discuss? Well, for the very simple reason that I am heading to the Edison Fly Fishing Show tomorrow. Uh, This is being recorded on Wednesday. I'll go on Thursday, spend some time hanging out with people on Thursday night, and uh, spend the night, and then head to the Fly Fishing Show on Friday. Now, my initial plans were to be there all day Friday and hang out with people, again, um, people that I haven't seen in a couple years because last year there was no Fly Fishing Show because of coronavirus. Um, you know, Friday night and then Saturday morning, uh, go to the show again. And it's usually a little bit more lively because of it being a Saturday and then drive home sometime Saturday afternoon back up to Boston. However, there's a very, very large snowstorm that is in the forecast. And usually you look at those things and say, eh, you know, what is, what is the forecast now? Well, uh, every model is forecasting a lot of snow. And so I actually made a change to my plans. I pivoted. I am going home on Friday. So hopefully I'll still be able to see everybody I want to see, talk to everybody I want to talk to. Hopefully um, the night before the show will be some good good time hanging out with people, um, getting something to eat and things like that. But that got me thinking, sometimes you have to change your plans. Sometimes you, you have your heart set on one thing, your mind set on one thing, a financial investment set in one thing, but for one reason or another, things have to change. That is not that abnormal. That's true in family, that's true in business, and that's true in fly fishing. And so today I'm going to talk about three major ways that you need to be ready to pivot. And some of them actually uh, have the promise of something good being in store. So actually, like you, you make a change. You thought you were going to do A, you end up doing B, and it ends up being a good thing. So that's going to be part of it. Um, but at the same time, just acknowledge that sometimes things just don't end up the way that we, we wanted them to. Sometimes things just don't play out in the way that we had planned. And that is part of being human. That's part of being finite. And that's just part of life. And if worst case scenario, it happens in your fly fishing world, then I guess that's okay. Um, a lot of t- we, we're not in control of anything, um, but so often we have this uh, this experience of things going so smoothly. And 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 if you do have something terrible happen, a terrible illness diagnosis or or some sort of accident or something like that, you know, obviously that changes your frame of reference. But I think that those exceptions kind of prove the rule, which is. Uh, more often than not, things kind of go according to plan for us. But you can kind of defray that. You can kind of um, mitigate that if you take into account what I'm going to talk about today. And again, these are just general ideas. Certainly, you can you have your own experiences, but hopefully just thinking through some of these packing, planning, preparing, 
uh, techniques and just ideas will will help you think about maybe that next trip. Okay, maybe you know I, I'm planning to zig, but if I have to zag, I'm at least ready for that. So I like that planning, preparing, and plan. What is it? Planning, packing, preparing. It's good alliteration. It's not what my my notes say. My three lines of notes, but we'll get to it. So the first one is um, is is packing. Keep diverse gear in your car. Anytime you go more than just the bluegill pond down the street, more than just to the, the, the river that's you know 15 minutes away, carry diverse gear. If you're planning on going fishing all day, if you're planning on going fishing for a weekend, if you're planning on going fishing for a week, carry diverse gear. Carry more than what you need. I mean, at the most basic level, what happens if you break the tip of a fly rod? I was with a buddy once who broke a fly rod on a uh, one night trip and he went to a fly shop and he bought another fly rod. Now it was a fly rod that he wanted anyway, but it was still, that's, you know, 500 bucks gone really fast. Carry two fly rods, but don't carry two identical fly rods only. Now that's not a bad idea. If you're going to a uh, moderate sized trout stream and you have your eight and a half foot five weight and you want to carry a backup eight and a half foot five weight or an eight foot four weight, then that's, that is a great idea. That's the kind of thing that I like to do just in case there's a problem. However, in that situation like that, I would say also carry maybe a, a nine foot six weight. And the reason being is what if that water's higher? What if just, just nothing is happening and you're, you know, either you have the whole day set aside and you want to take advantage of that, or you've driven uh, a, a little bit of a distance away from your home, having that nine foot six weight now allows you to say, okay, if there's no other trout stream nearby, now I'm able to fish for bass. Or, you know, you, you could even be the same river system say, well, I'm just going to drive downstream and I'm going to throw a popper on and I'm going to just enjoy doing something different. You know, you can't carry everything, but try to carry enough. So by keeping diverse gear, by packing in a particular way, you can't carry everything, but try to carry enough. So uh, this is a great example. You know, if, if you have a fly rod and a backup fly rod, don't bring a second backup fly rod. Bring something that is different. And we're going to talk about planning here in a second, but something that gives you an option to do something totally different in case what your initial plan uh, was isn't panning out. So the the other example would be you know you have your eight and a half foot five weight for fishing that medium sized trout stream and it's just not doing what you wanted. Now that rod would be a fantastic rod for most normal trout fishing situations, but if that stream just isn't working right or maybe the water's a little bit more muddy than you anticipated or it's crazy crowded, then having that seven foot three weight it's not a, a, a good backup fly rod to the eight and a half foot five weight. But having that seven foot three weight in the back of your car, now you can go into the tributaries or you can do a short drive upstream into where the, the stream becomes a, a higher gradient stream. And now you have a rod that is capable of handling those, those situations. The same thing, you know, you're planning on wet weighting. Well, bring your waders and boots in, in, just in case you find yourself in, in, in a deeper situation or something like that. You have your, your minimalist pack with only a couple of flies that you, that you know you will use on the stream that you're planning on going to. You don't have to bring a full arsenal, a full fly shop worth of flies, but just have a couple of boxes thrown in a duffel bag, thrown in the trunk of your car in case that stream doesn't work out. And now you didn't pack any woolly buggers and poppers, but now you're going to be fishing for smallmouth bass, and now you at least have those. So you're not going to have everything you need, you know, unless you 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 are a hoarder and an overpacker and an, an over preparer. Um, you know, you're not going to have everything you need all the time. Uh, there's there's definitely times of the year where that is the case, where uh, you know there, there's a couple week stretches where you're just going fishing all the time, and so what you do is you just start to accumulate things in the back of your car, and you really could go anywhere and do anything that you wanted. But under normal circumstances, it requires you saying, all right, I'm going to get everything that I need to go fishing for smallmouth. Again, for example, my my nine foot seven weight, my nine foot eight weight. I'm going to have a couple of spools of line, some floating line, some sinking line, all my popper flies, and I'm going to have um, a pair of sturdy boots so I can go go wet wading. And you get to the river, and the again the water's really high, or it's just nothing's happening. Maybe you're anticipating them to be hitting flies on the top, and it's just you're just not feeling having to go underwater. Okay, 
Well, make sure you have that, again, that seven foot three weight or that eight foot four weight in there so you can go up the hillside and you can fish for trout and just have one box of flies and you'll be able to make out. Now, could both situations, could the, could it be torrential downpours? Could it be a cold snap? Could it be something like that where just things are, are really all conspire against you? Yes. But more often than not, if option A isn't working out, option B is probably at least some sort of viable option. So to have the gear on hand that you need, then you can be ready to, to, to face those situations. So one perfect example uh, for, for, of, of this is, um, again, like I said, carrying bass gear with you. So just this last summer, I was had a couple of, of uh, Virginia trout streams I wanted to hit. They were bigger trout streams, and I went down, and it just wasn't happening for me. I was catching tiny little fish, and it was fun to catch the tiny fish, but it, just, it really wasn't what I was like excited about. And so I had thrown a six weight in the back of my car, and I had just one box of bigger streamers, and I said, you know what? I could either continue to grind out trying to fish in this stream, or because I had limited time, I'll head to the Shenandoah River and just catch some decent sized smallmouth. And that was a lot of fun. They weren't big, but but it, it definitely scratched an itch in a way that that trout stream wasn't. Now, could you call that bailing? Sure, absolutely. You could say that I didn't give it the, the old college try. I didn't uh, stick with it. But for me, that made my day a lot better. And it was a diversifying experience where I could look back and say, wow, I had a lot of fun fishing for trout. It wasn't what I thought it would be. And then I had a lot of fun for, fishing for smallmouth, even though I hadn't planned on it. So it's just a simple example where packing gives you an opportunity to explore diverse options. And what does that take? You know, if you have all your fly fishing gear in one spot, it means grabbing one extra fly box, one extra reel, one extra rod. It might take a little bit of, of just focus to make sure you say, okay, well, I got the rod, but do you have the reel? Do you have the right line? Is there is there a lead, is there a leader ready to roll that's on that? You know, all those things, they, they kind of lead up into the packing portion of that conversation, but it's definitely worth doing. All right, keep diverse gear. Real quick, just a, 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 one more word on, the, on that. Exact same thing when it comes to hiking and to camping. Uh, you, know, you, you want a couple extra things. The kind of things that you might need in a pinch are oftentimes things that you're really glad that you packed. So for a lot of this stuff, I like to just have a little duffel bag or a little uh, Sterilite container uh, where you just have some of the essentials in there that you probably don't use all the time, but are the kind of thing that you wish you would have had on you. It creates a good opportunity for storage and an easy way to throw them in the back of your car. And so instead of just kind of having everything all the time loose uh, in my, my drawers and in my shelves where I keep all my outdoor stuff, as the season gets rolling, I kind of make these little duffel bags and tubs, and that way, if depending on where I'm going, I can just grab that and throw them in the back of my car, and then I have that diversity of gear that's just on hand. Don't have to think about it. Don't have to make sure, you know, I, I know the reels that go in these tubs are reels. The line has been cleaned. The, the knots are good. The leaders are at a reasonable level, and I don't have to start from scratch when I'm out on the water. So that's the packing component of it. All right, the second one is the planning component of it. And this one it might, might sound like totally basic, but I think it's a lot of fun. This is where, where I think the, the opportunities pre that are presented from having to change from option A to option B are, are a lot of fun. And that is just know where you are. So read it diversely. Anticipate the fact that you might have to change your plans one day. So I've talked about guidebooks. I think a couple of weeks ago I did a podcast on different kinds of books and fly fishing. This is one of the reasons why I like guidebooks. You know, at different times of life, I've been in different situations where I have either found one stream that I've really enjoyed, I wanted to get to know intimately, I've wanted to spend as much time on it as I possibly could, and other times I've wanted to try new water, try something different, go somewhere new, see what I, is out there. And, I've, and and to be to be honest, there's a little bit of that grass is probably greener, like I've been having okay luck at this stream, but if I try another stream, that's when I'm going to start catching lots of fish and lots of big fish. So, you know, the, the, the reasons are, are really neither here nor there. But you have those options if you can read diversely. And you pick up a guidebook and you say, you know what, I know how to fish you know, the, the big river um, super duper well. I don't need a guidebook to fish the big river. No, but you know what? The, the left branch of the big river may be someplace you've never been, or mountain creek that flows into the big river, or um, you know, medium river on the other side of the valley. It might be on one day the fishery that you need to be at least somewhat aware of access and kind of general characteristics, 
so that when you go there, you're able to uh, enjoy yourself. You're able to get into fish. You're able to at least put yourself into a situation where you might be able to get into fish. And the reason for that is you have some sort of functional knowledge of where to go. Now you might say, ah, I carry my smartphone with me. I have a GPS. I can, I can figure it out on the fly. You know what? Those are very helpful tools. But just reading through kind of at a, a skimming pace information about some of the other streams around the streams that you know well and that you plan on fishing a lot can really pay off and actually make your GPS and your smartphone much better tools. Perfect example of this, from probably, oh goodness, maybe 15, almost 20 years ago, uh, I was planning on fishing the uh, Savage River in Maryland. Savage River, awesome fishery, uh, very, very smart brown trout on a larger um, high gradient stream. Really cool fishery, middle of nowhere, but at the same time, it's so good that a lot of people from DC and Baltimore and Pittsburgh uh, come and fish it. So it, the, the fish get pressure. And this day that we went, uh, the water was just funky. Um, we, we got into fish, but it just, the, the, the water was doing weird stuff. It had rained a lot the previous few days. And so we got into fish, but it just, we weren't feeling it. So my buddy and I said, well, what are we going to do? And luckily, that we, you know, I had no plans of fishing the North Branch of the Potomac. I had no uh, plans to fish the Yachigany. I had no plans to fish the Castleman, um, which are th three other rivers that are in the immediate vicinity, I mean, within an hour or so of the Savage. But because I'd spent time poring over a guidebook, as probably the, the Maryland Guide to Catch and Release Streams, I think is probably the book that it was. I knew that these were fisheries in the region. And so what we did that second day, which was a lot of fun, is we just kind of bounced from one to the other, kept our waders on, just fished a little bit, and got to see these different fisheries. Which, you know, did we catch a ton of trout? No. We caught fish, but it, we did we did we, you know, become intimately familiar with any one of these rivers? No. But for a, a place that was a little bit further for us, this was fun to be able to get a little bit of a flavor for each one of those streams. And so the next time we went back, we were able to make an informed decision on what we wanted to do. Say, well, okay, we're going to fish the Savage and the Yak, and that's how we're going to spend our time. And the reason for that was because not only had I spent time kind of having an idea of what some of the different fisheries were, but I also looked on a map. We did a little bit of cross-referencing. And, uh, you know, this was 15, 20 years ago. There were phones. We did have GPS. But having that DeLorme topographical map on the, the seat next to me and being able to figure out where to go, where the access was, was really helpful. And again, you can't always count on your GPS working or your 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 map might work, but the, the data component that's kind of underneath it to be able to zoom in really far, to be able to go to your web browser and look up information, that might not be there. So even though you have part of your tool on your smartphone, you might not have all the tools. So to be able to do a little bit of just kind of planning ahead of time from home and say, huh, this is 15 minutes away, it's half an hour away, this is just upstream, you just get on the interstate, and go down one exit, get off and go to north, just to have that in the, in the back of your head and then again, know where the access points are and generally kind of have an idea of that fishery. And, and little details like, you know, if other streams in the area are running high and off colored, this one usually cleans up first. Um, if, if other streams are, are really low, this one has a cold water release. Um, and little things like that where you can say, okay, I planned on fishing in this river, but it's not working out. But I know that because it's low, this river is probably going to have a little bit more water in it because it has a dam upstream where they control the release. And so I'm going to go there. That kind of planning can really, really help out, especially, again, if you're not just going fishing for a few hours, if you have a whole day or even a whole weekend planned. So packing, uh, planning, and third one, preparing. Now, I know preparing and planning are virtually synonymous, but Here's here's my very very brief word for this. This I'm saying if if planning is what you do, you know, out in front of you, preparing is what you do in between your ears. This is a mental thing. This is about adjusting your attitude. This is about being ready to do these things and not getting flustered if plan A doesn't work out. You could potentially have adventure. Now, maybe you are of a certain age or maybe you're of a certain disposition where that sounds like the worst thing in the world. But Maybe you like that idea of, you know what, I'm going to try something totally different. I'm going to set off to go left, but I'm going to end up going right. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to set off to go left, and I'm going to go hard left until I get to where I, I'm going, and then if it doesn't work out, you know what, I'm going to have the spirit and the attitude to go right and try something different. And that's, I think, a fantastic 
way to approach going on a fishing trip. Now, you might be of the mind, and, and I think we all are from time to time, say, you know what, I'm going to show up. Water's high, water's off color, water's low, fish aren't biting, fl- flies aren't rising. Um, there's a lot of crowd, but I'm going to grind it out, and I'm just going to make it work. And that's fine. That's a totally reasonable way to spend your time. But if you're doing that because you don't have flexibility worked in, or your idea of fishing has to align with exactly what your anticipated results are, then I would say maybe work in a little bit of flexibility. Maybe work in a little bit of a quotient for adventure into how you spend your time. And if you do so, you're going to find out that you're really going to get into new experiences, that you're going to find fish you never thought you'd find before, and you're going to just have this thrill of trying something new and different. Um, I've given examples for all the other ones, so I'll, I'll do one for this also. I remember one day where I went to my normal parking spot for a Spring Creek in Pennsylvania, and there was like five cars there. And I thought, oh man, you know, I was expecting there to be people. It's a beautiful day. Um, there's bug, bugs coming off like crazy, but this is just too much. I'm, <clears throat> I wasn't in the mood for grinding it out or trying to fish in between people. It just wasn't what I was feeling. So I said, you know what? I've got a couple different weights of fly rods in the back of the car. I'm going to head up the mountain. I never fished in the county north of me before. And so I just went up, and I knew there were streams from driving around there all the time. And I just started pulling off and checking out what was there, and I found some really, really cool water. Two or three different streams, tiny little brook trout. Everything was just beautiful and colored up, and just places that you you know that even though the fish were small, there wasn't a lot of them, that they hadn't seen an angler. Just the, the, the landscape was totally undisturbed and wild. It was just a really cool day going up and down this little stretch of the Appalachians in southern Pennsylvania and exploring because my initial plan of fishing this spring creek, you know, fishing big streamers under undercut banks for trout didn't manifest. So I ended up just hopping around, throwing my little, you know, size 14 yellow humpy behind uh, rocks and in pools and catch a brook trout in places I just never even knew existed. So it was adventure. It was fun. And, and I can still distinctly remember some of those locations today. I've never gone back to some of them, but on that day, it was just a lot of fun and a great little uh, alternative. And the third thing when, when it comes to preparing is to remember that bailing isn't failing. Now, how about that for something to, for you to remember? Even if you don't like it, you're going to remember it now. Bailing isn't failing. Giving up because you hurt yourself, you've broken a piece of gear, you there's bad weather coming in there's nothing wrong with that you'll be much happier to to prepare mentally to give up if things are objectively not going well you'll be better off doing that giving up calling it in going home licking your wounds starting over the next time than you will if you try to grind through it if you hurt your ankle if you you bust your rod at a like you know three feet down on a on a eight foot rod you're not going to be able to power through that no matter what you do. If the snow, if the forecast calls for snow, then just go home. I had a buddy and I, we did that once. We were all the way up in Erie fishing for steelhead, and the snow came in only after like 12 hours of fishing, and it was a hard choice, but it was the right choice. I mean, they closed down the highways minutes after we left Erie, and so we were actually very, very thankful and felt blessed that we decided to bail. It felt like failing at first, but then we realized, you know what? That was the right choice. The last thing we want to do is be stuck in Erie, Pennsylvania. Uh, I had to get down to South Carolina for school like in a couple of days, so it was really a blessing in disguise, and it wasn't a failure. It it just, uh, just didn't go the way that we planned that it would. So there you go. Three things to think about, hopefully some practical stuff, and then also some just kind of more, you know, in your head stuff. Um, keep diverse gear, know where you are, and have a good attitude. Pack right, plan right, prepare right, pivot right when you're fishing. This week on castingacross.com, Monday's article was kind of a, a it was, I wouldn't say it was last minute, but it was just, uh, it was something that popped uh, in front of my eyes uh, this week while I was just uh, browsing on the internet. It's called Big Hunting Creek working on 100 years of conservation. So Big Hunting Creek flows through a national park, Catoctin Mountain National Park. And it's also where Camp David is, but you're not gonna go there unless you are part of the president's cabinet listening to this, and if so, let me know. But uh, I read the national park news. It's just something that's fun for me, is always just kind of cool stories. Sometimes it's like, you know, 
person getting attacked by an animal. Sometimes it's uh, you know a, a new land getting opened up. Sometimes it's fishing related news. Well, there was a story about Catoctin Mountain Mountain National Park expanding their trail system, and it led me down a rabbit trail. And I read an article about how there's a group in town, the Brotherhood of the Jungle Cock, which is interesting, and I write about them in this article, who are um, advocating for a fly fishing. Uh, interpretive trail uh, on Big Hunting Creek. And this is a stream that gets a lot of use. I fished it a ton when I was younger because it was only about 45 minutes from where I where I grew up. But uh, this is a, a stream that gets a lot of pressure from Northern Virginia and from Washington, D.C. So it certainly could benefit from some of these uh, improvements. So that was my article on Monday. Definitely check it out. There's some links in there to where you can find out more about the area as well as some of the initiatives that are being undertaken in the park along Big Hunting Creek. Wednesday's article is called In Homage to the Vest. In Homage to the Vest. So one of the very first articles, one of the three first articles that came out on castingacross.com was called Gear Review, The Vest. I reviewed a vest, and it was kind of tongue-in-cheek. It was an attempt at humor. Um, here I am, uh, seven years later, revisiting the article. And so this is a kind of a, a retooling of that article just reflecting a little bit more of my style now. I think it's I think they're both really good. I think they're both good articles. So I would say you take a read. So head to castingcross.com, check out in homage to the vest and you can read that and then you can go to the bottom of the article and click on gear review the vest and you know, let me know which one did you like better? Did you like the one from 2022 or the one from 2016 or whenever the the uh, the first one came out? I've done this to about three or four articles in the last few years. It's just a fun little exercise for me where I can see kind of how how I've uh, developed as a writer and what Casting Across has done. This week's recommendation on the podcast: very general, very uh, big picture. But uh, if you have a need for sunglasses, check out Costa Del Mar. I'm a huge Costa fan. I have multiple pairs. I have them in the um, Sunrise Silver Mirror lenses. I have them in the uh, green lenses. I have them in the blue lenses. I have one pair of glasses for any fishing situation that I could find myself in. But now when you're maybe not on the water as much, it's a great time to go into a local sunglass store and try on a pair. You will be imp- incredibly impressed at the clarity that you get with the 580G glass lenses. That is the primary reason why I enjoy fishing in Costa Del Mar sunglasses and just wearing Costa Del Mar just all over, all the time. My driving glasses, my hiking glasses, whatever, my my running glasses. Um, it's the glass lenses. It is par- unparalleled clarity for only a little bit more than other premium yet plastic sunglasses. So Costa Del Mar, you don't need a link, but there will be a link in this podcast page on castingacross.com. Thanks for listening to the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast. Please subscribe in your favorite podcast app and rate the podcast in iTunes. Then head over to castingacross.com for three posts a week on the people, places, and things that go into the pursuit of fish. In Wild Country, rules were not created by man. Don't miss Wild Country, Wednesdays from 7 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Presented by Primos. Speak the language. Waypoint TV, the destination for outdoor entertainment. A life that has the stories to back it. A life to be proud of. It's a Winchester life. Yeah, baby. 6 8 Western. Oh, I'm the old there, baby, right there. Tune in every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern on Waypoint TV.